Yo, what's good, everybody? It's your boy, O3. Welcome back to Platicas. This is Platicas number seven. Platica number seven. I'm right here with my mentor, former mentor. I still call him a mentor. My boy, Alex. I'm going to let him introduce himself. Hey, what's up, y'all? My name is Alex Aldana. I'm actually the executive director of the Pico Easy Family Center in Santa Monica. So, you know, I've been doing that for about over 20 years now, it's, you know, it blows my mind when I think about it, you know. Um, but I basically started working there when I was 16, and, you know, now I'm closer to 40, so it's pretty crazy, you know, that, that whole journey. Um, but we can get into it later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, to begin every platica, at least like the introduction platica, uh, I like to talk about family. Right. It's a topic that is real close to my heart just because um, I never really talk about my family. Right. Uh, um, in a very like open way until recently. And so I always want to I get curious about listening to other people talk about their family. Um, so I'm going to ask you, Alex, what is your definition of family? I mean, family, a lot of times, you know, especially like in, in the Latino community, uh, you know, a lot of times family could be chosen. And, you know, obviously, like, I'm grateful to have, you know, be surrounded by, by a great family, both both by blood and extended family through through j just the nature of the work I do, you know. Um, so I feel like I'm very blessed. And, you know, I, I consider a lot of people family. I, I have extended family you know here in LA I have family in Fresno I have family in Mexico so I feel like I'm I'm a part of an extended family and also I have I have family at PYFC so there's a, I feel like I have like four different families so I feel very blessed in that way and I feel like I come from like um I come from an environment and a family that was, you know, had to go through a lot of things and we, we become uh, very resilient throughout our history. And um, I'm very proud of that. So I'm proud of the family of where I come from and um, because they, they've, um, they've mentored me and given me a lot throughout life. So I'm very grateful to them. And um, yeah, wh where would I be without my family? You said your family's from Mexico. Uh, let's get into the roots of where um, your ancestors come from. Um, where does Alex Aldana's roots start in? Okay, so my, my parents are from um, Jalisco, Mexico. My, my dad is from uh, Te Tepatitlan, Jalisco. Um, my mom is from Puerto Vallarta, Jalisco. You know, two two very different towns, you know, um, the the Paticlan is in the in the highlands of Jalisco. Um, they call them Los Altos de Jalisco, and um, Puerto Vallarta is more of a, of a. It used to be a fisherman's town, but now now it's become over, over the last like thirty forty years it's become a very uh tourist town. You know, it's 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 become like um, so like a vacation spot. You know, it's 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 similar to Cancun. You know. Um, so there are two very different towns, you know, my, my dad, my dad grew up like on a farm and my mom also like grew up, well, both my parents grew up in poverty, but, you know, they, they kind of come from different backgrounds. My mom, you know, her, her, her dad was like a, a br bricklayer, you know, he, he made bricks and so did the entire family. So my mom started working at a very young age. And so did my dad. So, um, but but they had you know different experiences growing up, you know. Um, but you know when they came here to the U.S., um, their first job was like farm working, you know, up in uh, near San Jose. You know they they worked in the strawberry fields. So um, they they educated me about that experience and the importance of you know um, farm workers and the United Farm Workers Union. I think I might have said that wrong actually. It's the it's the United Farm Workers. 
So I learned I learned about that when I was young, and um, I kind of carry that with me ever since like middle school, high school. So yeah, that, I don't know if I answered your question, but no, nah, yeah, that was beautiful. Uh, that was yeah, good. that's uh, thank then, you, I appreciate it. Where do where do you come into the picture? Like, how many siblings do you have? Where do you fall into the into the that line? Are you an only child? Let's, let's get into that. <laughs> Actually, um, I'm the youngest of five. Um, I have two brothers and two sisters. Um, but by the time I was born, you know, all of my my siblings were already like older. You know, um, I had two brothers were like two, my my two brothers were eighteen and nineteen respectively. Um, one of my sisters was like sixteen, and then the one that's closest to me was fourteen years old already when I was born. So. You know, they they already had their own lives, you know, when I was born. So I kind of, you know, grew up in a way like almost like only child because I didn't really grow up around them, you know. So um, I didn't really have that um, the same com camaraderie that, that they did. So um, I feel like in a lot of ways I, I did grow up on myself almost like an only child, even though, I, you know, I, I had older siblings um, I didn't see them as much. And um, yeah, so it was kind of a unique experience for me. And uh, when you were born, your family lived in Inglewood, correct? Or in Santa Monica? No, my, my, my family lived in um, in the Pico neighborhood in Santa Monica. Um, you know, when my when my when my family moved to L.A., um, my parents actually moved to um, Venice first. In the early 1970s, and then around around the mid 70s to 80s, they moved to Santa Monica, to the Pico neighborhood, um, right there next to Santa Monica College on 17th and Delaware, and that's where we lived for like the next 20 years, um, until until later on, um, with when my dad uh, bought a house in Inglewood, like in around 91, 92. That's when I moved to Inglewood. Um, but, you know, later on in life, um, like around 2000, I moved back to Santa Monica and was there for like three, four years. And then I moved back to Inglewood. So it's been, you know, and I, there was a period there where, where I also, I lived in Mexico for two years when I was uh, seven years old to uh, nine years old. And um, I also lived in Culver City, West L.A. So there was a lot of moving around, you know. Um, I feel like, you know, that that's like a similar experience for a lot of people in L.A. You know, we, we have to move because of different, like, e economic factors, gentrification, and different factors, you know. So I feel like... You know, my, my experience is not that different from other people's, you know, especially um, working class families, black and brown families that experience uh, gentrification in the neighborhoods. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think we, we learn. We learn from our different experiences and, you know, just having to move around and every every city and community we live in, we learn something from. Um, and I, I feel like I learned, I learned different things from every every community I lived in. You're West LA baby, dog. <laughs> That's all it is, dog. You're West LA yeah, baby. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm on the West Side. Yeah, from the West Side. You said, That's for uh, sure. you said you were uh, way younger than your older siblings, right? And I've yeah. known you for a long time, and and you were one of the first fools that really like sat me down and gave me real knowledge on like the roots of hip hop and like underground real conscious hip hop. Right. How different was that? Like, do your siblings listen to that kind of music or is that like something that is only unique to you? Nah, my, my siblings don't listen to, to underground hip hop. They, they might listen to like, a little bit like of a commercial hip hop, but not really underground hip hop. You know, I kind of learned um, the first person that you know really introduced me to underground hip hop was one of my, my one of my best uh, friends in middle school. 
His name was Pablo, Pablo Losa. And he was my neighbor in middle school. And so like he he would come to my school. I mean, he would come to my house after school and we would listen to NWA, Easy E, a bunch of a bunch of dope music, like even the DOC. That that was kind of my, my first introduction to underground hip hop was like in middle school sixth grade you know when I was 12 12 years old and then from there I started doing my own research and you know I just got that that passion that itch to to like learn more about hip-hop and underground hip-hop so I kind of taught myself after that you know and I started meeting me I started meeting other people that were into like underground hip-hop and that that's kind of how my interest grew from there yeah, it wasn't like um, for me it was kind of like the same, right? Because I grew up in uh first gen, obviously first generation Mexican American. Grew up, parents bumping straight like Mexican oldies, or like like that kind of music, the fucking temerarios, you know, like <laughs> cumbias and just romanticas, bu- los bukis, yeah. you know, shit, that kind of music, right? And so, yeah, when I got introduced to rap. Uh, it was around the same time I started learning English in like the early 2000s. Mm. The first foods I was listening to was like Eminem, 50 Cent, you know. But then as time went on in elementary school, I got into like the whole West Coast gangster shit, right? Well, at the, at the yeah. time, it was already uh, no longer what was considered mainstream because the, the Chronic, um, I mean, the Chronic 2000 was like, uh, the the chronic fucking the the one he dropped in night was a ninety nine right he dropped it in ninety nine with explosive yeah, yeah. and and it all those in, kinds of songs yeah that was in ninety nine um that was you know that was only a couple years before the, uh like that was that had been dropped a couple years before I started learning English mm-hmm. I was a little kid when that album dropped but talking about like NWA's greatest hits you know like that kind of music Bone Thugs and West Coast gangster shit. And then in the middle school, all Chicano rap. Right? So it wasn't mm-hmm. until high school where I started listening to a lot of that more boom bap shit, right? And then Yeah. Um and then it wasn't until I went like I started doing a little bit of my own research when I started doing my project on socially conscious hip hop. But I remember when you were you were showing me a lot of like underground rap fools like dilated right because obviously mm-hmm. like we hear about dilated but we don't listen to them and you're like no nah, listen right. to dilated uh i was already like into psycho realm but you were like no nah, listen to psycho realm more dog. you know what i'm saying you were telling me to listen to psycho realm dilated um you were telling me to listen to um two mex i remember you were like listen to two mex you kind of sound like two mex i remember people were telling me you sound like two mex when you spit yeah. So like visionaries, like that kind of underground music. Mers, remember we went to those Mers that Mers concert at yeah, Amoeba. Like, it, it was uh, I think it was Rhymefest. We might have gone to Rhymefest. I don't think we went to Rhymefest, but we went to um, it was at Amoeba. I don't know if you remember. Oh, okay. This. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. Yeah. That Mers was performing at Amoeba Records right there when it was yeah, still yeah, on yeah. when it was still on Sunset. So like yeah. I was talking about like that underground LA. Uh, that kind of shit. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Almost like, um, I'm trying to think of other fools, dog. You know, like that Tagger underground stoner well, shit fool. You know, I remember you were really into Jeru the Damager. Oh yeah, yeah, Jeru. I started listening to a lot of that Gangstar Foundation, like uh, yeah. those fools. The, the Alpha Rob became a big fan of Alpha Rob. Yeah, yeah, he's dope. And so it wasn't like. Till I till I met you and and, and other fools like so where, where they're like no nah, listen to these fools because you yeah. know you, you obviously you learn about the the famous the icons like Biggie and Mob Deep and fucking yeah. Snoop Dogg and Tupac but you're like nah fool, go listen to fucking uh the alcoholics go listen to Afro Ra go yeah. listen to Jeru go listen to fucking uh go 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 mm. deep into the Fujis go you know what I'm saying yeah. I okay. probably I probably talked about Gangstar too, you know, because I'm a big fan of Guru no, yeah, Premier Gangstar. Because I mean, I remember when I first listened to Gangstar, it was like in middle school, but yeah, um, I didn't. I don't think I became. I think I became a bigger fan of Gangstar when I started going to the PY. Yeah, 
I'm still there. Right. You know what I'm saying? And uh, they they were just like one of those things. Shit. Now you good for you? All right. I think it's mine. Yeah, well, it's cool though. Like it's, yeah, it might I, be mine. <laughs> nah, that's cool. Ain't no, ain't no thing. But yeah, Gangstar fool. Gangstar is a perfect, perfect example of a certain a legendary group that I might have known about, but it wasn't like a part of my listen. It wasn't like on my playlist and shit. So I give you props yeah. for that. And so I always wonder, like you know, because we talked about hip hop, but we never, I never really asked you like where did that love from hip hop really start because you know this might be a little sidetracked from the family conversation but i remember you threw a hip-hop event in santa monica right yeah you were one of the main organizers it was the one nation what was it called well one nation hip-hop summit we 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 started that in uh 2007 and we did it in uh, we actually did three hip-hop summits we did one in 2007 2009 and the last one we did was 2010 and uh, the concept of one around that was the whole theme around it was like using hip hop to educate and empower students. Um, it was a the One Nation Hip Hop Summit was like an educational conference and concert. And the first year in two thousand seven, we had KRS One perform. We had the Visionaries um, and a lot of other artists, like underground artists. In 2009, it was more like a conference, but we did have Dilated was there. Um, you know, Evidence and Rock the Hour Science. They they came through and uh, and blessed the conference. They were they were on our hip hop panel, and so you know we we got a chance to talk to them and ask them questions about their career. We also had Kid Frost on the panel. I think we even had uh Chang Weinsberg from the uh, Gorilla Union, which was. At the time, Guerrilla Union was the biggest hip hop promoter in LA and probably the country. Um, uh, Guerrilla Union was responsible for organizing Rock the Bells, the festival, um, which which they, later on they, they got sued. They got sued by LL Cool J, and uh, LL Cool J took back the rights to Rock the Bells, Dang. the Rock the Bells festival. So now LL Cool J owns that. Um, so that's a cool little story right there. Um, but I, I still have a lot of respect for for Chang and everything he did for hip hop, uh, especially the underground scene. Um, because through that, like LA was introduced to to Merce on a bigger level, like the Pay Deuce Festival happened because of like Guerrilla Union and Chang Weisberg. You know, so I'm very grateful to him and all of the work he did. Um, he, had, uh, Chang was the first person that reunited uh, Wu Tang back in like 2001. You know, and he brought like um, Rage Against the Machine back together. So I think he did a lot for the movement. You know, and he doesn't always get the credit for it because of what happened with LL. You know, but. It's all good. It's all love. I see. I didn't know that shit, dog. I was um. I started going to PY twenty twelve. So that last, the last one that finished was a couple years before I actually went there. So I never got to experience. Yeah. Oh. The one I nation. To talk, yeah, I forgot to talk about uh what what we did in two thousand ten. Um, in two thousand ten, we actually we had a P Rock and CL Smooth perform. Um, we also had Onyx. An X Clan perform at our at our last hip hop summit, um. So that was real cool. I have a picture with all of them. I, I gotta send it to you. Um, maybe yeah, I've never seen put, that shit. That's dope. Yeah, maybe we could put it that picture on the podcast when I send it to you. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll put um, that shit down. Ain't, ain't yeah. no thing done. You feel me? Yeah. So I mean, basically, like through the hip hop summit, I was I was living my dream, you know, because my my dream was always to do something like that, you know, to do. To bring like a big music festival to my neighborhood, you know, we were able to do it uh, in Santa Monica at Santa Monica High School in Barnum Hall, you know, um, and not many people could say that they, they did that, you know, that they lived their dream. Um, it took a lot of work. It took a lot of, you know, we had like a we had like a team of like 15 people working on this event, you know. 
we would meet every week. Uh, we we had like a committee, so like shout out to everybody on the committee, you know. Um, and a lot of them are still my friends. We still keep in touch. So, you know that that work brought us together. You know. To tie back to the whole conversation about family, because I know hip hop has a certain, um, I don't want to say it's like a certain stigma for in the Mexican community, right? When, especially like when parents don't understand it, right? Because I remember when I was a kid, you know, my parents don't speak English, and you listen to hip hop and they hear the shit that we're, you know, that we're listening to, and it's all fucking. You know, it's not good shit, dog. Like, that gangster yeah. shit, it wasn't good shit. You feel me? Then you yeah. look at the images, the tattoos, the guns, bro. Like, the just a certain... There's a certain negative image that... Yeah. Quite frankly, dog, like, doesn't represent the full, you know, image of hip-hop. It's just a part of it, you know? But it doesn't... It's not, like, the full image of what hip-hop is. I think hip-hop itself is such a big, you know, like... It's, it's hard to just put one picture to it, but there is some fucking street elements tied to it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so my question to you is when you started your journey, when you were listening to hip hop, because at the time, you know, like you say, you were listening to Easy e MC Rand and all that shit, NWA, were your parents approving of it or were they like, nah, mijo, stop listening to that shit? No, nah, well, my, my parents didn't really know what I was listening to, to be honest. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. like, I would come home. I would come home after school, and nobody was home. Like, like my my dad was was working. My mom, you know, she was in Mexico. Like, so I didn't have no adult supervision. You know, when I came home after after school, you know, so I, I would like listen to whatever I wanted to, watch whatever I wanted to watch. I had a I had a black box back in the day, so like the black box was like. You know, you can watch all the channels and stuff, you know, all the movies and shit. So, yeah, the, my, my basically my house was like the kick it house. Everybody would come to my house after school and kick it, you know, and we would listen to music. Um, shit. I'll tell you a crazy story. I, I was probably the, the first, like back in 96, like around my middle school age, like I was one of the first kids on my block with internet. Ooh. Like we like we didn't have internet back in the day. Like I was one of the few kids that had internet. So like back in 96, like it was like something brand new, you know? And so like a lot of the homies, a lot of my friends at the time, they loved coming over to just like hop on the internet, you know? And like ch we would go on to the AOL chat rooms, <laughs> you know, like yeah. and cause cause of ruckus, you know? That's crazy, dog. So, I mean, I'm yeah. a little young, too young for that, dog. Uh, but I've heard stories about those AOL chat rooms. You know, that could finally feel like the very, very end where everything had died down. But um, I think for me, it was more like Yahoo Messenger. Uh, yeah. So, so and so all it's that the, shit. It, it's the same thing. Yahoo Yahoo Messenger is like AOL chat. It's the same yeah. thing, you know. So um, you you kind of get the idea. And so since you didn't have any adult super supervision, um, were there any like concerts for like that? Out, like out here, like at least like on the West side, like hip hop concerts that y'all would go to and shit. Nah, not that I would go to. Um, I think the closest like venue that was doing sh a lot of shows back in the day was probably like the El Rey Theater, which is like a mid city. That was probably the, like the closest venue that I can think of. Uh, other than that, a lot of the big shows happened like in San Bernardino or like even in like downtown LA. But at that time to me, like downtown LA felt like far away, you know, when I was in middle school, high school, that shit felt far away. So like, I didn't really go to those shows. I went to like, if there was a show at the LA, I might go, you know, or somewhere else closer. But yeah, I didn't really start going to shows like until like after high school, you know, which is pretty crazy, you know. So did at any point before your family ever find out the kind of shit you were up to or not? 
Um, they they kind of found out when when I started like uh, going out to different hip hop shows and even organizing my own hip hop shows. That's that's oh, when shit. they. Yeah. yeah, that's when they found out how passionate about, I was about it, you know, because a lot of times, you know, like the shows in like at two in the morning, like I would have to call my brother to pick me up, you know. So so then that's when my family used to like that's when they realized, oh, this this kid's going to like a bunch of different shows, you know. Um. So, yeah, it wasn't until like later on, you know, that they realized like how involved and into what I was, you know. <laughs> That's just crazy, dog. Yeah, hey, when they would have had to... a good experience, though, you know. Yeah, yeah, they didn't realize it until like they have to pick me up at two in the morning from like a random spot in LA, you know. Uh, that shit. You know, my parents. I don't think my parents ever picked me up. I was always one of those fools. Like I'm gonna make it home somehow, some way, dog. And shit, yeah. dog. That's that's like uh, I mean, for me, dog, like. My parents were around food, but having a language barrier made it so fucking easy to do whatever the fuck I wanted. <laughs> they came to watching sh- like videos, yeah, uh, or, like watching certain movies, dog, like like the rated R movies, like like pothead movies, like gang movies yeah. and shit like that. It was so easy, just because like all we had to do was make up some shit. It's like, oh, it's for school or some shit, you know? Like, oh, I'm doing yeah, this for yeah. a project, and the music, you know. I mean, we had headphones or whatever, you know, you listen to that shit on your on your headphones or earphones. I mean, I didn't really, I wouldn't really want to have like loud ass speakers and shit like that. So we weren't really bumping music like that. They yeah. knew we listened to rap music, but the only rap music that they ever heard us listening to was the one on the radio. Yeah. Obviously the ones on the radio, the, the curse words are bleeped it's off. Like, yeah, it's like censored. You know, censored. But, you know, I, once we found out you know, like about LimeWire, you know, once yeah. we heard, once we found out about LimeWire, yeah. it was a fucking rap, dog. We didn't give a fuck about the radio. Yeah. We're like, boom, boom, boom. And then a couple years later, YouTube, fool. And then the whole YouTube explosion happened. Yeah. And it was a fucking rap, dog. Um, But yeah, that's, that's dope, fool. That, that, well, it's dope that you had internet, dog, in 96. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's dope that you had to experience that shit uh, behind your parents' back or whatever, because, yeah, hip hop is fucking beautiful, dog. Hip hop well, is beautiful. Well, it, it was actually like thanks to my dad too, cause he he was into the internet, you know, and my my, my dad was big into like the chat rooms back in the day, you know, <laughs> and uh yeah, so it was kind of cool, you know, um and and also when I was in middle school, I, I used to have a boombox, so like I would play CDs on my boombox, play it loud, you know, so my dad would hear it when he would come home, you know, and he would tell me to turn it down or whatever. Um, and then sometimes I would play it in the car and he would want me to like not listen to it or whatever, but that was the extent of it, you know? Um, sometimes I would ask him, I would tell him, Hey, I would tell him like, Hey, let's go to Best Buy, you know? And, um, uh, cause I wanted to buy like some CDs. I wanted to buy some music and then I would go to Best Buy to buy the music, you know? And, um, uh, yeah, so that was my experience. I'm going to tell you a funny ass story, dog. When I finished, I, I think I've told this a couple of times already, but when I finished fifth grade, mm-hmm. um, I was like real big into NWA, right? Like real big into fucking like the whole West Coast gangster shit. I didn't really relate to it. I'm fucking 10 years old. Right? <laughs> you know, I'm still fucking trying to figure out what the fuck I'm doing, dog. I'm, you know, I'm still kind of like a good kid. Still don't have that freedom to do go and do rebellious shit. This is before I started smoking and drinking, whatever. Yeah. For my parents, for my culmination, when I finished fifth grade, dog, they gave me a, a NWA's greatest hits season. <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> I'm Ten years old, fool. Literally bumping "Fuck the Police" loud as fuck, dog, in my house, fool. Thinking I'm a fucking G or some shit, you know what I'm saying? And but I mean I had good grades, dog. I you know I graduated yeah. like second in my class, and I was doing good things. So they were just like, "Fuck it," you know. It's lo que get it. They didn't understand a single thing, obviously, except like obviously when you hear "fucking easy," call you know say some bitches or say "fuck," you know the word "fuck" or "fuck the police," you know certain yeah. curse words. That's all they understood. You feel me? Uh, but to me, dog, like I'll never forget 
when they when they bought me that NWA's greatest hits CD, dog. I feel like there was a couple CDs that we got when when I was a kid, dog. Like that were kind of questionable for like uh, if I'm my dad, and my my mom right now, I'd be like, why the fuck did you buy me this shit? Like mm -hmm. the fucking the G unit, the Beg for Mercy album. You know the That's first crazy. G unit album that they fucking dropped that that one, yeah. the Eight Mile soundtrack CD. Um, there was like a yeah, was we didn't really they didn't really buy us that many CDs because I, you know once Slimewire came out we were burning our own CDs. Yeah, um, but they stopped tripping fool. They they literally stopped tripping about the music the moment that they figured out that we could make bootleg CDs. So. And once I started making bootleg CDs for my dad, it was a wrap, dog. Because now at that point, he couldn't say shit. You feel yeah. me? It's like, like, oh, I'm doing this shit. Like, you know, he's helping me out. Like, it was one of those things where it was like, fuck it, dog. Like, whatever. And then once I started making, like, once I started making music, it was at that point, it was like, whatever. You know, like, it just became whatever. So that's mm -hmm. dope, man. That's, that's fucking dope. Uh, but mm -hmm. let's move on from family. And, well, hip hop is big part of your career the hip-hop the the one nation summit and let's get into the the py right because the py is a big part of your life you're obviously the executive director now um, yeah so let's let's talk about alex at the beginning of his journey you were 16 years old right when you said you started going to the py yeah i was 16 and the the U center opened in uh 2002 so like i was at i was at the grand opening you know and um you know, I, re I really, like, from there, like, I started creating, you know. I started creating, like, building relations with everybody there, with all the, all the you know, other high school students. And um, one of the first programs we started as a group was, like, the Youth Leadership Council. And what the Youth Leadership Council was, like, we were just a group of, like, teenagers, high school students. And we kind of, you know... We basically like try to make our dreams real, you know. So like, a lot of us had of ambitions of like doing different field trips or programs. Um, and one one of the first projects that I worked on was like a poetry slam, you know. And then from there, from the poetry slam, it went to like a a mentoring program, which we we, we called the youth to youth mentoring program, which was like um. High school students would go mentor, um, like fifth grade students at a local elementary school. We would go every Friday um, to John Muir Elementary School, which was down the street from the youth center. And we would go mentor like fifth grade students. We would help them with their homework uh, once a week, like every Friday after school, we would go. Um, so I helped start that program. And then from there, you know, Obviously, it led to like the One Nation Hip Hop Summit and other projects. You know, you know, kind of it snowballed into different different events and projects. You know, um, but by my real start, my real, you know, I started to gain my voice in the Youth Leadership Council, which was like a, a space for us to to create and be leaders and create some of the first programs at PYFC. Whose idea was it to, to like bring in a fucking recording studio to the PY? Um, I believe that was Oscar's idea, but it might have been a collective idea of like Ernie G, from Proper Dose and Oscar because they they were friends from high school, and Ernie G from Proper Dose was our first, uh, music instructor at PYC back in the day. Um, for those who don't know who Ernie G is, he's like a a famous like West Side producer and DJ from the group Proper Dose. They used to have a radio show on Power 106. They released a couple albums. Um I think through Sony Records. And they they were both from Santa Monica and Ernie G was a producer. He was the DJ of Proper Dose. And uh he was also um PYFC's first music teacher in the studio, you know. So, and uh, Ernie G was a friend of Oscar's from high school, you know, and that, and that's kind of how the music program started, you know. So it was, it was definitely, I want to say Oscar's idea, which was probably 
it was helped helped by Ernie G to launch it, you know. Did you ever <laughs> did you ever sat down and write a verse, Ali? No, I was more like uh I, I never like wrote bars. I was more like I would write poetry and shit, you know, like a slam poet. Um I did it a lot in high school and then, you know, once I graduated from high school, I stopped, but you know, I've always been into hip hop and you know, I've written verses, but I've never I've never like well, actually, I'll take that back. I might have spit something in the early days when we first started the studio. But I don't I don't think we ever released it. Oh damn. Alex on yeah. the mic, dog, that should have been dope. I think yeah, because now now that I now that I think of it, I did record something, but I don't think we ever released it. When you when you were going to the PY dog, when it was barely like, you know, becoming what it became or what it has become. Like what was like your life like, dog, during this time? Like you, how you were like at sixteen, and then you would say you were doing the youth leadership council. What was your life like during tw like at twenty, dog, when you were going to the PY? At twenty, I I was probably um I was going to SMC Santa Monica College at the time. So you know um I was I think I was trying to find myself to see what what path I wanted to take, you know, in my career and just like with education, you know? Um, so I always saw myself like going to SFC and then transferring after two years. Um, I did end up transferring, but it took me like, it took me four years instead of two years. Um, so like, I kind of always wanted to, that was my goal was to go to college and shit. So when I transferred the first time I transferred to UCLA, um, but once I got to UCLA, I had I had some issues and I wasn't able to attend class at UCLA. So um, I think it was like around, I'm trying to think what year it was, maybe like around 2008 uh, when I got to UCLA and then I had to drop out because of um, basically like UCLA wouldn't let me enroll in classes. So I'm like, fuck this. And I quit school for like six years. Woo yeah. So like from from 2008 to 2014, 2015, I was out of school, you know. And then I started taking like, so I, I had like a six year hiatus from college. Um, I was just fed up. I was really discouraged, you know, by my experience at UCLA. So, you know, I was like you know, fuck, fuck going to school, you know, fuck all this. And um, it wasn't until like six, seven years later that, that I got motivated to, to finish school, you know? And um, I went back, I went to, I took a class at SMC first and then I ended up transferring to Cal State LA. Um, and then, you know, after like nine months, I graduated with my, uh, with my BA in sociology and Pan African studies from Cal State LA, I applied to uh, grad school at USC um, in a master's business in a, in a business master's program. Um, at, at USC, I got in. This was like 2015 or 2016. Um, I was at USC for two years. I graduated in 2018. And um, I actually j just applied again to UCLA for a PhD program in uh, educational leadership like two weeks ago. So I might be uh, going back to UCLA. Redemption hopefully. article. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Which would be crazy, you know. So I might actually be going back to UCLA in September. That's dope, dog. Yeah. That's fucking dope, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, that I never would. I never. I never would have thought. You know, if you asked me like a couple months ago, I thought I was done with school forever. You know, and uh, cause I had told myself after I got my master's, I was done with school forever. You know, and then two weeks ago I applied to <laughs> a PhD uh, program. You know, and when when I met you, how how old were you when I met you? I met you in twenty twelve. Uh, twenty twelve. So I was. 
I was like 26, maybe. So it was around that time, right, where you were office. You were in in school when I met you, but um, we'll talk about that right now in a bit. But you were. Well, I I hadn't got back to school yet. When that did was public... like. Go ahead. Go. What do you want to say? Public allies. Um, that that was before I went back to school. I went back to school like two years later. All right. So when did public allies happen? Because I met you when you were. It was your. It was a one year program, right? What is public allies? First of all. Public Allies is a leadership development program through AmeriCorps, which is a federally funded program. I think it was started by Michelle Obama. Um, so like, uh, Public Allies is like a, a paid internship, like a paid uh, leadership development program, and that I was a part of from 2011 to 2013, because I, I reapplied after the first year. So I was actually in the program for two years. Um, yeah, so, like, it's a cool program, you know, anybody, anybody that, it's typically for, like, people that are coming out of college that want to figure out what they want to do with their life and what career path they want to take, so a lot of, like, you know, recent, like, high school graduates or college graduates apply to college uh, public allies to, like, gain ex professional experience. That's what it's really for, is to gain professional experience uh, working at a nonprofit organization like PYFC. So that, that was my experience with public allies. Do you feel like the public allies experience motivated you to go back to college? Uh, yes and no. It motivated me because when you finish, when you finish like the first year of the program with public allies, they give you a, they give you an educational stipend, you know, and in order for you to get the, the educational stipend, you have to enroll in community college. So that, that was kind of, it, it was in a way it did, it did get me thinking about going back to college because I'm like, damn, I, I have to enroll to get this educational <laughs> award, you know, which was like $7,500 or whatever it was. I think that's how much it was. So, yeah, it, it kind of got me back to school in a way, but I, I wasn't really motivated to finish at the time. It wasn't like a year or two later that I really got motivated to go back to school and finish. And then you get a random ass email, dog, in fucking like September or October of 2011, right? You get a random ass yeah. email, fool, from a fucking random ass fool talking about. Hey dog, uh, you think I could interview you for my project? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> remember that shit? And, I do. And I, I remember I sent Alex because I went to a school, right? Uh, project based learning was like the fucking like the motto. We had projects. My project was on socially conscious hip hop and its effect on society, and how you know we could use hip hop for for uplifting and for positive, you know, positive. Um, what's it called? Just for, for, you know, just using positive words and shit like that, right? Um, and I sent an email to, like, all these other organizations. And then my boy was like, hey, fool, hit up the PY, hit up the PY, dog. My, I used to go there. I used to be an intern there. My yeah, mentor's name was, my mentor was, his name was Alex. Hit him up, hit him up. And I was like, nah, nah, nah. And he had told me this, like, the first semester of, no, it was my second semester. I forgot what the fuck he told me, but he had told me, dog, at some point. And I kept delaying it, delaying it, delaying it. And I started, you know, hitting up all these other spots, like Street Poets, Homies Unidos, like, uh, like Homeboys. And I was trying to do, like, this gang intervention, youth intervention, you know, with a little bit of hip-hop. And then once yeah. I started getting into the hip-hop, using conscious, you know, lyrics to uplift our people's black and brown youth and, you know, just do positive stuff with hip hop, learning about the history of hip hop. Yeah. And then that's when I was like, oh, you know, fuck it. Let me look into this. Mm -hmm. Went on the website, Pico Youth and Family Center. I was like, oh, fucking Santa Monica. I was thinking for, I remember I was thinking, <laughs> I heard Pico. I was like, all right, fuck it. Pico Union, Psycho Realm. All right, fool, it's going to be right yeah. here down the block yeah. type shit, right? Hell no, nah, dog. It's in the fucking by the beach next to the fucking the, the high school. 
I'm like, oh, hell no. I'm like, what the fuck am I going to do out there? You know, like, this is where rich people are at, fool. No shot they're going to know yeah. what the fuck. They, you know what I'm saying? That's what that's what I used to think. Mm -hmm. Hit this fool. I'm like, all right, fuck it. Went on the website. You know, at the time, Oscar La Torre was the fucking the, the director, and there was all these other yeah. fools. And, and he was like, I was looking for Alex Aldana. I was like, all right, fool, boom, unseed, whatever, right? And I hit him up. It was like a email interview, right? You remember this? It was like an email interview. Yeah, 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 I remember. And then we kept chopping it up. Then I got uh, authorization from my school to go on a shadow day. And I went, it was like November. It was a couple of days after Dia de los Muertos. Mm -hmm. November 2011, I pulled up. I was fucking confused, dog. I was in fucking shock. Fucking Dia de los Muertos, fucking decorations everywhere. There's a recording studio. Everybody in there is fucking raza, dog. There's a couple, you know, uh, black students in there, fool. And I'm like, what the fuck? You know, like, I'm in shock, fool, because, like, obviously Santa Monica, it's a different... You hear Santa Monica, fool, it's a different picture. Yeah, I'm you thought it was going to be a bunch of white people. Yeah, exactly. I thought it was going to be a bunch of white people or just, like, rich people, fool, you know? And I was like, people with, you know, in sandals, fool, like, you know, getting ready to yeah. go to the beach. Full walk in there, dog. Full banged out. Full smelling like bud. You know, fucking yeah. full talking about alcohol and shit. I'm like, what the fuck? Full like I'm, you know, like I'm trying to escape South Central. I'm trying to come here to do music in the, you know, like in the studio, have a clean ass <laughs> vibe. But I literally just stepped into another fucking <laughs> South Central, a mini whatever. In my head, yeah. it was like a mini South Central. Come to find out. The Pico neighborhood in Santa Monica has its own storied history for like its own, you know, resilience and, and their power, yeah. and their, their history of like the power struggle between the city and the, the community. And I learned all this shit. They won. Boom, boom, mm. boom. Got cool with Alex. Then I was like, hey, fool, you think you could be my mentor? And I'll never forget this, dog. It was uh, January 3rd, 2012. It was a Tuesday. Wow. It was a Tuesday. It was my first day back at school, I think. Yeah, I think we didn't go to school on a Monday. It was my first day back at school, and I left. We used to, they used to let us go out early to lunch so we could go to our internships and shit. So we'd get our lunch. We'd leave at, like, 1 o'clock, and I was like, boom, boom. And this is before the expo line was even a fucking thing, right? So I had to figure out, yeah. you know, a way to get there. You know, luckily for me, dog, I'm a mastermind on the metros and whoopty woo. I yeah. got there. And this is the funniest story. <laughs> the funniest story that Alex likes to tell about my first like two weeks at the PY. I swear, dog, like I had I was I was like amazed that they had a studio. I, I love the fact that I love the fact that there was fucking like a community, dog. I love the fact that it was like Rasa everywhere, you know, the black and brown unity fool, and, and everybody was all about love. And even if they weren't uh they weren't like really like welcoming. I wasn't really welcoming either. You know, I looked a certain way. And then Alex kept telling me, What you kept telling me for? Like, hey, go to the studio, go meet some people. <laughs> yeah. Go to the studio, go meet some people. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was it, funny. It, oh, in, it, in my in my head, I knew you would get along with the guys in there. Like, I knew you would click with like people like Chris and other people in there, you know? So I, I knew that that was, that was the place for you to be because. I feel like there was other like-minded individuals in the studio, you know, and uh, there was, you know, you really connected with Chris and surreal, and all fools that, you yeah. know, all, all of them, you know. So now my uh, question to you is, because I never really asked you this on a, you know, years later, different, different perspective, different mind state. Because I know you had like the fool that connected me with you. He was your intern, like, but that was like years prior, right? Yeah. Like Juanito, when he was there, he you were yeah, still Juan. in school, right? Um, I, I think he might have came in like a year or two before you, like uh, maybe 2011, 2010. Um, because he's not that much older than you, right? Uh, no, nah, he's like my brother's age. My brother's three and a half years older than me, so he's my brother's age. Okay. So maybe he might have been there, like, because he, re he, he remembers some, but he remembers the hip hop summit. Yeah, okay. He might have been there for like 2009 when we did the one with the dilated people. 
either that or 2010, you know. Um, but he was your intern, right? Yeah, and, yeah, exactly. And were you prepared to have an intern at the time? Like, did you even know what the fuck an intern was? Yeah, I mean, because we we would periodically, we would have, like, um, volunteers come in, you know, and we, we would have to, like, show them the ropes, like, give them orientation, you know, and kind of help them out and understand the culture of PYFC, you know, and how they can help, you know. So, I mean, I didn't have, like, an intern directly that worked with me, but I was used to, like, you know, talking to people and kind of, like, walking them through the process of, like, PYFC and the culture and kind of just, like, bringing them into the family, you know, because that's what it really was, is, like, when you come into PYFC, it's kind of like coming into someone's house and you become part of this family, you know? Um so that's that's what it was to me and that's what I I tried to, you know, um engender into people was like, you know, this is this is who we are and um you know, we, we wanna make you part of this part of this movement, you know. Um that's what I really stress to people. It's like bigger than individuals, it's really it's really like a movement and we wanna make you part of the movement. You know, um, and then when and then when I hit you up, were you like, were you surprised or was it just like business as usual? Um, I think you you had mentioned in one of your emails that you know that you know Juanito and yeah, of course I remembered Juanito, so I, I knew I knew exactly what to expect. You know, like the type <laughs> of, the type yeah. of program you were in. You know, I, I loved it. You know, because I feel like we needed more of that. You know, so and then. Later on, I come to find out that your your counselor, your counselor, I think it was she was your counselor, Jane. She used to be a volunteer at PYFC. Like she was a a graduate was student. Yeah. Was oh, it Joan, Jane? Joan. Joan, Joan, yeah. Joan. Yeah, she was one of my yeah. advisors. She wasn't my main advisor, uh, but she was one of the uh well, they're called advisors. They used to be called advisors at my school, but they were technically teachers. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so Joan was a was a like an intern at PYFC back in the day. Like she was a UCLA student and she she would intern with us back in the day. I think it was like maybe like 2006, 2007. So I remember her from back in the day and we, we didn't realize that until later on. You know, you know, but yeah, so I mean the the connections were there, you know, the the, the seeds were planted like long before you Stepped into PYFC it was like it was meant to be, you know. I'm pretty sure she's the one that told Juanito about the PY. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that was the case. And then yeah. Juanito told me, and then I told Ocio. The... Yeah, so she planted the seeds, you know. Yeah, that's dope. That was fucking. When we figured that shit out, I was like, "Damn, fool!" Like, I thought it, you know, like you, 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 because like. We're we're from out of town, right? Like we're from a whole different part of it. Yeah. Like yeah, our you know our experiences might have been similar, but it's a whole different fucking lifestyle. It's those different experience for living in South yes, Central, South uh, Central versus Santa Monica, Santa types, Monica. Yeah. Food, you know, yeah. it's a different dynamic. But to know that there was like a, like a lineage, you know, in terms of like people that came from my high school or my my high school don't exist anymore. To mm. me, that was that was beautiful and shit. And then being your intern, dog, I think to me, like, look at it, looking back at it now, I think it was dope that you were my mentor and because Soreal wasn't working there at the time, right? If Soreal would have been my mentor or like if I was just a strictly like music intern, yeah. I don't think I would have had like such a like a passion and commitment to the overall center, right? Mm. To the, to, to be participating in like all the other shit, the protests that, and all that stuff. Yeah. To do be a part of the protest, to be a part of the, the, the workshops, to be a part of, part of the, the, the discussions and, and to be a part of just like everything that wasn't related to the music, the music stuff obviously yeah. was what kept me going and what kept me fucking, you know, engaged. But I think to me, dog, being at the center dog just being there like it, it you know it, i could could i could honestly say that it did save my life dog because you know yeah for i you know eventually i got cool with chris and we were doing what we were doing but 
we would still come back and you know i would you know sometimes stay after hours now and kick it with soul dog like when he would when he would come from his holly and shit like yeah that but i think about it like if soul was my mentor i don't think i would have had this like first of all i wouldn't i wouldn't have been able to put the py in my in my resume going into college Mm -mm. i wouldn't have been as committed to it so i'm you know i'm blessed that you were my mentor dog because yeah you know not only did you teach me about the pico neighborhood and you taught me about hip-hop you also told me about you taught me about college and you taught me about sociology food because that's what you know that's what you were about yeah and so um You you were you know like you you helped me with those those hip hop and society presentations that I would put together with the lyric breakdowns and you know tying Mm -hmm. like the influence of hip hop into mainstream culture and shit like that. So that's dope, dog. Like to yes. to to look back at it now and be like, yeah, this for Alex. Dog. That's why I was hit you up like boom boom fool. That's why. I appreciate it, man. man. It's a blessing, you know, just to think about all this stuff, you know, and you know the 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 impact, you know, we can make in people's lives. Just and sometimes you don't even realize it. Sometimes you're just talking. about your life or your experience, you know, but you could still have an impact on somebody's life. And really, like, I don't try to preach. I don't, that's one thing I don't, for me, like, I don't try to preach to anybody. You know, I just, I just talk to people and talk from my experience, you know. Um, so I don't try to put myself, like, in a position where, like, oh, I'm the teacher or whatever, you know, and you're going to listen to me. I just try to have conversations with people and try to talk to them about, you know, this is, these are like the two options. You can go, you can go this route or you can go this route, you know, but these are the, these are the decisions that you can make, you know? And, um, that's just how I go about life. And, you know, I really try to, you know, I'm big, uh, I'm a big advocate of like, you know, the, the four agreements. I don't know if you read that book. I have it before. Um, I haven't read it though. Yeah. So it talks about like, You know, like, there's these four agreements in life, you know, like, be impeccable with your word, don't make assumptions, don't take anything personally, and always do your best. So I, I try to live by those four agreements, and I, I, re I remind myself every day, like, hey, you know, don't take anything personally, because sometimes people could talk, people could talk crazy about you. don't take it personal. That's something on their end, you know, that they got to deal with, you know. Um, so I, I just reflect on that and, you know, reflect on, like, even some of the things you're telling me is like, man, I, I didn't realize I had this type of impact on you, you know, because I just, I don't try to be like this high, high and mighty person. Like, I just, I just share like my life and personal experience with people, you know. You're probably just living in the moment. Like we're just in the moment, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It, it was it was a beautiful time. Yeah. And so the reason why I hit you up to be a part of the podcast was because like I saw the clip to this documentary that is being made about is it about your life or well let's let's get into the documentary, fool, because I, I, I come out in the documentary and I obviously talk about my experience being your intern in the documentary. Yeah. But we already talked about like my part is going to be, you know, it's going to be summarized and we're going to talk about it in the documentary, but I want to know Yeah. what the fuck, like how did this come about? Like what, what's up with it dog? Like how did, what was the idea? Like, let me know fool. Yeah. The, the, the documentary, uh, it's the, like the, the initial vision like started as a, you know, I wanted to do like a documentary on PYFC um, and try to, to try to like capture like different stories, you know, and kind of like the history of PYFC. Um, so we started this process of like, you know, searching for like who would be a good director for this documentary. So uh, last, sometime last year, maybe like even a year and a half ago, we started we started interviewing like different film directors and documentarians. And I think I interviewed like six, six different like filmmakers and I really, I really wasn't feeling it. And then like on the seventh interview, 
I really connected with this filmmaker um, named Jeanette Godoy um, because like my my interview with her was more like a discussion. It wasn't really like we weren't even talking about like film concepts or anything. It was just she wanted to get to know me, like what I was about, you know, like how did I get here, you know, that type of thing. So we we could we really connected on a personal level, and um, so that's how kind of like the the process kind of started, was um. Was my with my connection with Jeanette and and her like fascination with with my story of like um, starting at the PYC when I was sixteen and then you know kind of like starting as a volunteer and working my way up to like executive director. She was really like fascinated with that story and and additionally like she was like amazed that, you know, somebody with like a disability like myself, like I have cerebral palsy, that I'm doing all of this stuff. So like she really took a liking to my story and decided to make the the whole pitch of the documentary kind of like centered around me, you know, like the story of Alex within PYFC, like kind of like to show like, if he could do it, you could do it too. And, you know, oh, he also belongs to this organization that does great work. So that's kind of how the story came about, you know. Um, and then we started filming it um, back in uh, in June, you know, with this uh, with this amazing surf day. It was actually my, my first time surfing uh, in my life, you know. And it was actually the, the first time that I've been in the water in over 25 years. So I hadn't been in the water since I was like 13, you know? So for me, it was like a a crazy experience, like a nerve wracking experience. Like I was, I was nervous because I'm like, well, I haven't ever, I've never surfed in my life. I've, I haven't been in the water for like a long time. I'm like, how, how is this shit going to go? I don't know. But I'm I'm willing to take the ride, you know. It's and it was like a roller coaster for me, you know. I I imagine that's how like a roller coaster feels like, you know, when you go to Magic Mountain and you get on the, all those crazy rides. That's what it felt like to me, to go surfing. Yeah, I seen that um, clip. I was like, "What the fuck, homie?" <laughs> yeah. Like, so. What the fuck? So I I caught like twenty waves. In like uh in twenty minutes I caught like twenty waves. Oh, you were out so, there, little kid yeah, so, style, huh? Yeah, so they so they told me that that's a lot of waves to catch in like twenty minutes. And that was meant to be, fool. Yeah, so it was it was crazy, and um yeah we we got it we got most of it on film so that's the beautiful part that we're able to share with people, and you know the story is still developing. You know we we're not finished with the documentary yet. We still have to a lot to film. Um, like you, like you mentioned, we we filmed the surf day. We've also like we had another day with all interviews, which you were a part of. Um, we're gonna film like probably like two or three more scenes. We gotta do family interviews with my family, and I wanna I wanna do something in my neighborhood, you know. So we're gonna do something like in the Pico neighborhood. While well, you're dropping and, spoilers and shit, or what, Alex? Can't, damn, well, this, this this is just my vision. We we haven't shot it yet. All right, but I'm just sharing like part of the vision that that I have. You know, it may it may it may change, it may change, but that's kind of like what I want to see. Yeah, mm-hmm. when they when I remember, I forgot what the fuck I was going through a rough time in my life. Though I'm not even gonna lie to you, dog. Like I was going through a big change, full spiritually, dog. Like mentally, that like I was battling shit. And then I got a text message from a random number. I think it was like an email full. And I was like, what the fuck? Like a documentary about mm-hmm. Alex. I thought it was a scam way. I uh, was, yeah. I thought it was a scam. I was like, what the <laughs> fuck? Like, nah. Uh-huh. And that's why I remember I hit you up. I think I texted yeah, you. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you you texted me. I was like, yo, I got a uh, email from from this lady, uh, Jeanette. Like, Tom, I was, she's doing a documentary about you. Is this true? <laughs> that shit was funny dog and this way yeah. was like yeah yeah no yeah it's true and i was like all right for sure so i responded to her did the interview it was my first time ever do- doing something like that it was crazy for like doing seeing the lights and the microphone uh-huh. 
you know, seeing all these people behind the camera. I don't, you know, like if, if in my head, like if I'm going to do something like that, I wanted to just be the interviewer dog and the people filming and the sound crew. But there was a bunch of other people there, you know, so I'm not going to say I was nervous, dog, but I was like, oh, shit, dog. You feel me? Because I mean, yeah. first of all, I wasn't, you know, men mentally, dog, I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. But I was like, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do it for my boy. Like he's my mentor. You know, he helped me out a lot. So it was no hesitation for me. I, you know, I didn't give a fuck yeah. if I was going through it, dog. I didn't give a fuck if it was raining. Remember how it was raining that day? That that was the day that fucking the hurricane was supposed to hit and Bro, the earthquake. I was like, fuck it, you know? And I pulled up, seen cameras, dog, lights everywhere. Like, she's asking me all these questions and shit. I felt like I was getting interrogated. <laughs> dog, it was it was crazy. It was dope. It was a cool. It was a cool. Experience. Yeah, you you did, you did a great job. You did a great job. You know. Um, and so like, man. you know, all it, all it takes is a little bit to get me rolling, dog. So honestly, I felt like I was, you know, I was in that bitch being a natural, mm -hmm. you know. But at first, I was like, fuck, dog, like you know. But it it was dope. So it was a cool experience. But yeah. ever since that day, I've always wanted to check in with you. It was like. Like what the fuck? Like what is this documentary about? Because you might have told me, fool. Like you might have told me that day, but I wasn't there. Yeah. Was, like, my mind was somewhere else, and shit. But it's dope to to, to yeah, keep, man. To well, a documentary about you and your in your life. I'm grateful to you, you know, because I feel like you know you had a lot of important things to share that that I didn't even realize. Like some of the stories that you told, like. You know, like I just reminisced because you know I I had forgot about some of those stories, you know, and and just to hear them from you is so powerful, you know. Yeah, and then um, bro, that like going to it, going through it, like at home, mentally, and then going there, and she's asking me like to relive these tough moments that I never talk about, like because we always talk about the cool shit about the PY, right? Yeah. But, People know, like, like I talk about in the documentary, like, there's there were certain struggles that I had to go through me personally to just try to make it to the fucking studio all the time. During yeah. during school hours, after hours, while you weren't even there, you feel me? And so, like, my dedication to the PY was beyond the 3 to 7 p.m. Tuesdays and Thursdays that I was getting school credit for. Yeah. But when I was talking about it, like it was like it was also hitting me, and I was like, "Damn, fool!" Like, you feel me? So it kind of got me reminiscing, not in the moment, but like after when I had time to reflect, because I want to go kick it with Soul, right after. Mm -hmm. And I was just chilling in the, in the spot. I was like, "Damn, dog!" Like a lot of the shit that gets forgotten about, because we all we think about is the cool and the good memories, and there was a lot of good memories. We don't. Yeah. Now I'm trying to make it seem like. There was like fucking I had to survive tidal mm -hmm. waves and shit to get to the P or not, but it was like it was a struggle. It was dog, a struggle, yeah, for sure. It was a fucking struggle, dog. And it was it was a it, it, you know, it made me realize like damn fool, like I was really fucking out there, dog. Like at eleven PM fool. I remember uh when we protested and I got home at six in the fucking morning, fool. Six in the morning on my 18th birthday. I didn't even get to see my mom, my dad, dog. Man. Like, because my when I went when I left to school that morning, it was still January 7th. Full so boom. You know, so when I got mm -hmm. home, it was already my birthday, fool. But like I was out there fucking celebrating. Not celebrating, but I was out there protesting with the whole fucking PY dog. That's fucking like, crazy. And so when I think about that fucking pain of not sleeping, dog, the pain of missing the bus, fool, or having to walk home at one in the morning, fool, because the fucking metro de gets delayed, fool, like, that shit right there, dog, like, it fucked me up, for me, dog, it fucked me up. But it, it was Man. dope to, to, to hear, like, the whole shit they're making a documentary. And so when I seen that clip, I was like, get the fuck out of here, dog. This was, <laughs> this was out here. Uh, this was out here swimming and shit. Like that yeah. was dope, man. Or surfing. So what yeah. is like uh, what is like the timetable for this documentary, dog? Like, what is it? Like, is there a uh expected date to be dropped, or is it just are you just going with the flow? No, we 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 don't have a definitive timeline right now. Um, but I do I do have a meeting with the uh, Jeanette coming up, like in the next week or two. So come on, come on dog. You know I'm very. 
I I want to I, I want to try to get it done like by the end of this year, you know. I'm always trying to write spoilers on the side and shit. Like, oh, this fool is dropping in. And yeah, like, in. um, yeah, because we do have work to do. We still, have, like I said, we have to film a couple more scenes. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's there's not a definitive like, oh, we're gonna get it done by this day. You know, that's the conversations that I need to have with you know Jeanette and everything and scheduling of of other shoots. You know. Um, but hopefully, um, I want to get it done this year, you know, and then uh, who knows? I mean, maybe by the end of by the end of twenty twenty four, we can premiere it, you know, um, have like a private screening of it, and then I think that would be that would be awesome, you know. But you know, you you can't you can't put sometimes you can't put a date on a on a creative process, you know. It's like creating a music album. Yeah. You can't really like put a date <laughs> yeah. on it, you know. You just have to create and put your best foot forward. See, Mahon. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the best way to put it. Yeah, but I'm I am gonna meet with Jeanette uh, next week. I'm actually gonna call her tomorrow, and uh, cause we we've been we've been like you know emailing each other, texting for the last like week or two. Um, I I know she she wants to get this done too, so we're gonna get on the same page. The last segment that I want to talk about is your future. So I don't really do this. I have never done this, but for you specifically, because you were my mentor, dog, and and I was there when you were. Were you, what was your your was your position outreach specialist? Yeah, I was the outreach specialist like back in the day, and then um, I gave my like later on as I grew into the position, I gave myself the title of like director of outreach. And so <laughs> you, <laughs> you became the director of outreach, and then now you and then kids. they and then after the director of outreach, I became the associate director, <laughs> and then. After the associate director became the executive director in 2020. It's been four years since you became yeah. the executive director, my boy. Yes, yes. What has been a good thing and what has been a struggle? Man, well, the, 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 first, the, the first big struggle was like right after I became the, dire the executive director, like COVID hit. You know, so we, we had to deal with COVID for like a whole, you know, year and a half. And like, obviously, like no organization had ever dealt with something that I like closing all the facilities and doing everything virtually. So that was a major struggle, you know, um, because we, we had to shift everything. We had to go virtual for all of the programs. And like we, we, we but the good thing that came out of that is that we started a food distribution program in the Pico neighborhood. So I would say that that's like a positive that came out of, that came out of COVID was the food distribution program in the Pico neighborhood. Uh, Pico care, we called it Pico cares. And we did that for like almost two years. So that was a positive that came out of COVID. Um, so, that, you know, I, I really want to, you know, I would say that that's like a good victory, you know, and uh, reconnecting with the community, the Pico neighborhood, uh, which kind of leads to this story, you know, this whole documentary kind of leads back to the Pico neighborhood and where I come from, you know. Um, so it, it is like a full circle, you know. What is um. What is what is next as the executive director besides the documentary? Uh, next for me is like building more partnerships, more more institutional partnerships, like partnerships with Santa Monica College, UCLA, um, and even the city of Santa Monica. I'm actually meeting with the with the city manager uh, on March 12th. So we're gonna talk about um, different uh, opportunities and projects that we can work on together. And maybe we can even get refunded by the city of Santa Monica. That would be a major step forward. So, like, those discussions are going to start next month, 
you know so that's that's what i look forward to and also another thing i look forward to is is obviously like starting this uh phd program at ucla hopefully in september and uh, i'm pretty sure that, that that's going to make the documentary being a py alum when i went there completely different right there's a gang of recording studios there's film equipment everywhere what is currently going on at the PY right now? Yeah, so we we have a robust film program. We actually um two of our film students from the Samo High um they're working on projects right now. One of them is called Chasing Daylight, which is um Chasing Daylight is about uh four four teenagers that are kind of like you know, we we had a discussion earlier today about, you know, how do you define family? And sometimes it's like our family comes in different in different forms. It could be like our friends that are people that we choose to be families. And that's kind of like the story of Chasing Daylight. Um, this young woman, um, I should say student, her name is uh, Genesis Santiago. She developed uh, this film in our program. She wrote this. She wrote the script for it. And um developed this project at PYFC um, through our film fellowship program um, this past summer and, and she shot it she shot it in August and now and now the film is complete so in the next couple uh, hopefully by by April we're gonna be able to premiere it like at a, at a private screening and she she wants to do a, a film festival run so we're gonna submit it to different film festivals. And I, I'm hope I'm hopeful that she wins a couple of awards, you know, because it's really a great film. And um, this week we actually shot another uh, short film. One of our students, uh, Alex Petrosky, um, he shot a a short film called uh, it's called what is it called? Not the cult, but it's like called the following or something like that. Um. And um, so he just shot it like two days ago, basically. And right now he's, he's just started like editing it. So in the next couple of months, we'll be able to pr premiere those two films. And um, also like for our music program, we're doing all the score for these two films. So that's powerful. So we, we try to combine our music and film program as much as possible. And we want to involve like the music students with the film process as well, and we're we're doing that, you know. So, I mean, we could only go out from here, you know. And I think we're gonna we're gonna. One of my goals this year is also to like expand. I, I want I want a bigger, more modern office. So, I'm looking for an, an office, a bigger office right now, and. It might be uh somewhere close by, you know, but <laughs> that 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 that's that's I don't want to give away too much because nah, G, you gotta drop the the but, phone but I, right here, dog. I'm 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 manifesting it, you know, because burn out the spot. Yeah, exactly. So I'm I'm working on it right now, bro. Tell hey yo, tell those film kids hey, O three music video, dog. Next project. Hey, let's do it. Let's do it. In the alley, like, dog. Fuck it. Fool on some gangster shit. Dude. In the alley. Yeah, we can do it in the alley. That's dope, bro. Like, it's cool that the PY is still, you know, like doing its thing. No more compilation albums. Well, we have we have a playlist. We have a playlist on Spotify. I got, I got to put you up on it. Um, I got, I got to send you the link. Uh, and we got to We got to I think uh, Darren might have talked to you about adding some music to the playlist. You know, you told me about it, doing a performance somewhere. This was a couple months ago, though. Okay, I, okay, I'll I'll talk to him again because I, I wanted to add your music to the playlist as well. You know, because that's like that's our new form of like a compilation album is like this playlist. That's dope. Right now, right now it's like thirty songs deep. You know. Well, whenever I have chance, for like whenever I'm I'm in the area on Tuesdays, I'll stop by. Yeah, we'll chop it up a little bit more. Yeah, definitely. But my final question to you, Alex, to end the platica, is the one question I always like to ask my guests. Because this is an, this is the introduction platica. I want you know our platicas to to be recurring. 
uh, slowly building a network here, you know, mm -hmm. um, right now we're probably like a couple heads deep, but have a platica about, you know, the documentary when it drops, we'll have a platica about fucking, you know, something else for, we'll talk about, we'll have a platica about random shit like movies some other time, but at least for yeah. this introduction platica, I want to end with this question is if you could talk to your future self, what would you ask him? Um, I, I would ask myself, are you happy? And what would you like to accomplish? Boom. <laughs> there it is, dog. There it is, my boy. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for pulling up to the, to the platica. Friday night, recording it Friday night. I know, you know, it's probably probably busy being the executive director, but thank you for taking time out of your night to to do this podcast episode with me. Um, it's my pleasure, my pleasure, my honor, you know. I know we re we um, recorded another one a couple years ago, but I deleted all those episodes. Like I said, mm -hmm. you know, I was going through it. I was going to, you know, that's for a different story, but yeah i was you know i was always a pleasure chopping it up with you even if it's off camera like the other day we, when i when i pulled up even if it was for like five minutes and i was like i gotta get this for alex on the podcast so thank you um Th thank you i really appreciate it man and for the next one it might be next week it might be two weeks from now it might be 100 episodes from now i don't know mm -hmm. i'll just keep you i'll keep you in the loop but any final words Man, just stay positive, you know, stay, stay positive, stay blessed, you know, um, um, you know, just there, 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 there's so much, you know, so much inspiration in, in, in this world, in this universe, you know, so like, just, just when, whenever you're in a dark place, you just think of like, try to be in a quiet space and think of something positive, you know, and try to get through it you know because life is hard you know and it's, it's we just can't beat it beat ourselves up so much you know like don't don't be so hard on yourself you know just just embrace life for what it is you know and roll, roll with the punches perfect perfect final words mm -hmm. thank you again alex and uh if you're listening and watching this on YouTube, don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, hit the notification bell so you know when I drop another video, when I go live. I'll see y'all when I see y'all. Don't forget to love yourself today, all right? Adios. Stepping out the door with some fresh 90s. The old whites, the drips nice. Yeah, I might see, but I don't wear eyes. Still a fool that looks fly. Got my button down on. That's gonna